Hello everyone, wherever you are watching Romatsky. From our headquarters in Kiev, we present you the only primetime TV show explaining in English the geopolitical storm that's happening in Eastern Europe. I'm Andrei Kulikov, and here's what is on offer tonight. Ukraine bans Russian online platforms. Defense or censorship? How society reacts? Is it efficient? Crimean Tatars commemorate victims of mass deportation. And how do they preserve their language today? Ukraine's President Poroshenko meets German Chancellor Merkel. Does Germany may really contain Russia? Go to our webpage en.romatske.ua, where you can find full versions of the reports and interviews. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Search Romatske International. We will be back in a few seconds with very special guests. So Ukrainian ban on uh, Russian social networks kicks in. This is part of the wide set of uh, expanding sanctions against Russian companies in relation to the Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine. By signing this decree, President Poroshenko has banned the use of uh, very popular Russian social networks of Kontakte and Odnoklasniki, the email service mail.ru, on which I once used to have my email address, and the search engine company Yandex. All four are in the top 10 most popular websites in Ukraine. The decree by Petro Poroshenko includes more than 400 companies and more than 1,200 people. Vukontaktia, Yandex, and Adnoklasniki will be banned in Ukraine. These companies feature on the list of almost 500 businesses, foundations, and organizations sanctioned by the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine. The Ukrainian president, Petro Poroshenko, signed this decree on May 15. These sanctions will affect a number of Russian TV channels, banks, airlines, charitable organizations, as well as separatist organizations and battalions. The sanctions are set to last for a period of one to three years. Antivirus software companies, Kapersky Lab and Dr. Webb, are also on the list as well as the business management software, 1C. Most Ukrainian organizations use this software for accounting and management. 16 million Ukrainians use Vukontaktia every month. Around 10 million Ukrainians use the search engine Yandex every month, not including mobile users. Ukraine is now among 30 other countries that have banned certain social networks. 1,228 Russian, Ukrainian, and foreign citizens are affected by the list of sanctions including the singer Yosef Kobzon, the ex-Ukrainian MP Alek Tsaryov, soldiers Igor Gherkin and Igor Bezler, and head of the online publication Ukraina.ru, Olyana Berezovska. Companies and people included on the sanctions list, according to the National Security and Defense Council, are threats to the internet and cybersecurity of Ukraine. So the video explaining the uh, size, the scope of the ban fails to mention, fails to show the uh, protest meetings, rallies, that started almost immediately after the publication. And I have the honor and pleasure to introduce to you our special guest tonight. This is Artem Bidenko, the State Secretary of the Ministry of Ukraine for Information Policy, and Maxim Tuliev, board member of the Ukrainian Internet Associations. And I suspect that they have uh, conflicting views on the issue, or am I trying to influence you? Uh, who's going to start? A general evaluation of the act by the president. Well, Mr. Bidenko. Um, for our ministry, this decision doesn't include any conflict because we uh, don't see the world as only white and only black. Uh, we understand that there is a very thin border between censorship and uh, informational security or even national security. And for us today the challenge is not to quarrel about if this ban is needed or not. For us it is understood that this is absolutely normal to ban uh, resources which control Ukrainian citizens 
which help control uh, Ukrainian citizens by uh, Russian uh, FSB. So, uh, what, what about the American CIA? <laughs> uh, there are no evidence, real evidence, that uh, social uh, networks, yes. networks like Facebook, are controlled by CIA. But there is an allegation published <laughs> recently that FSB through Facebook. <laughs> Uh, in tried at least tried to influence the Brexit campaign and the campaign of President Trump in the, in and America. That's a very good case because in today's or yesterday's Washington Post there was an opinion article about what measures uh, Facebook will do to avoid control and also to avoid being a weapon, uh, informational we weapon, uh, and. A lot is a lot was written about uh, Fra French elections, American elections, and Facebook uh, shows that it is open and transparent uh, for decisions that help uh, uh, help uh, uh, not overgo this thin border between censorship, influence, and security. Has the Ukrainian uh, uh, government addressed the social networks and uh, other companies mentioned in the sanctions list uh, with an appeal to try to do something like, for instance, the uh, Facebook does? Our minister wrote a letter in February this year to contact uh, I, I don't remember, uh, the Klasnik, it seems for me, uh, we, we didn't wrote to them, mm -hmm. uh, to contact uh, asking to close publics of separatists. And we had no answer. And vice versa, we have contact with Facebook. Uh, uh, previous week, our deputy minister, Dmitry Zlotuchin, was on big conference where he again met with uh, Central Europe uh, director, Gabriela Czech, and they had very good dialogue about what should be done uh, for Facebook to be more transparent and uh, less I I influential, influenced by uh, separatist terrorist or pro-Russian groups. Artem Bidenko, the State Secretary of the Ministry of Information, will be coming back to you shortly. Maxim Tulyev, board member at the Ukrainian Internet Association. What's the take of your organization or maybe your personal take on the situation? For my personal take, uh, I would bet you $100 that Facebook will be banned in one year in Ukraine. Okay. Uh, the big problem is not uh, ban of contact your underclassniki. Uh, I believe it's a general good idea. Uh, but how can it be done? Uh, when we do some ban, the first ban, first website in Ukraine, uh, we're opening a big can of worms. So the price of this blockage uh, is much higher than the effect uh, it uh, can be reached. Uh, at first, uh, we have to build uh, censorship uh, infrastructure. Like uh, all operators and providers in Ukraine should buy some equipment, uh, install it, uh, set it up, uh, begin to interact with some kind of Roskomnadzor uh, kind uh, company. Uh, I think it will be your, your, minus, uh, your, uh, your agency. Uh, and uh, after that, after some time of uh, maybe one year, uh, it will work as expected. So right now, uh, several internet operators uh, and telecom operators in Ukraine uh, banned contact and Mail.ru uh, just by blocking the network ranges uh, of uh, these companies. So a lot of, uh, lot of websites, a lot of web projects uh, that uh, are not in sanction list uh, was banned. Uh, so to make a precision banning, uh, there, there is uh, equipment, there is infrastructure, there is... Uh, interaction with uh, government agencies, so what we have in Russia. Uh, I believe uh, it's not a good idea to get uh, this instrument uh, to uh, Ukrainian government uh, persons uh, that are, we know, uh, very clean and very honest, uh, so there is no corruption, uh, no protectionism, so it's very good idea to give, give these instruments. So uh, we uh, actually if if we are talking about Ukrainian government officials, and one of them we have in yes. the studio, but we go to a higher level, 
Uh, pardon me for saying this, okay. Mr. Bidenko. Here's what Alexander Turchinov, the Secretary of the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine, told the nation regarding the new internet ban. And mind you, the National Council for Security and Defense is viewed as initiators of the controversial presidential decree. Let's listen what Mr. Turchinov said. First of all, these networks were used on the one hand to illegally gather the information. On the other hand, the information warfare against our country is performed via them. They are used for brutal propaganda, and they were even used for the recruitment of the network of agents by Russian special services, and there are a lot of other issues with them. We are a European country. We basically have a visa-free regime with Europe, and surely we have to limit options to use pirated content, especially with the use of aggressive information networks, such as Russian social networks. So this is the opinion of one of the people in the country who are regarded as shapers of the policy in the sphere of information uh, security in particular. And, uh, but my question is uh, rather personal. Have you discussed in social networks the controversial decree? Mr. Bidenko goes first. The discussion began in December. Uh, last year. For you personally? Uh, yes, for us mm. personally also, because uh, a group of uh, members of parliament suggested uh, two or three uh, law drafts on uh, such a ban. And it was even uh, a public discussion by these uh, members of parliament uh, about, and even some quarrel, between uh, uh, opponents of this idea and uh, those who are for this idea. In February, we had even our ministry was interfered in this quarrel. So for us, there was a discussion and we saw numbers that 75% of people, this is not a so sociological yeah, sure. survey, but uh, around 75% of people in country, they are for such ban. But they are you against people, censorship. People, people who take part who, in social networks. Works. Yes, sure, mostly yes. in social media. Mm -hmm. uh, but these also these people are against censorship. And we should understand there is a huge difference between what is done in Russia or China, for example, and what is done in Ukraine, which has a lot of uh, uh, the same as it is in Canada or, for example, in Germany. So it's normal in abnormal situations. What's the opinion of the man from the... <laughs> Internet, Inter Internet Association. Of course, I disagree with you. Uh, because of, of even. Of course, <laughs> I disagree. So even you don't even have to listen to your opponent. Uh, in the United States, uh, the network neutrality is the primary uh, freedom of network. Even in Israel, uh, which is a country uh, doing uh, war or anti terroristic uh, operation, every time from uh, the uh, founding of this country. Uh, the freedom of uh, internet uh, is the basic things and they uh, denied to ban uh, any website technically. So, okay, there is responsibility for uh, illegal activity in the web, but there is no technical possible, no this equipment, no this infrastructure uh, to ban uh, any uh, website uh, by network operators. We have a... Um, mm, we have a sequence of tweets from social networks and from different sites. Of course, the debate rages online. That's why I asked you whether you took part in online discussions. So let's see. Uh, when will Ukraine learn that emulating Russia's repression is no way to distinguish itself from Russia? Wrote an executive director of Human Rights Watch, Kenneth Ross. And he added, if Ukraine wants global support, it should revoke decree flouting global standards to bar Russian social media. Reporters Without Borders, a rather authoritative international organization, stated that Nothing can justify such a blanket ban. Daniel Holdgen, director of communications at the Council of Europe, tweeted, blocking social media goes against our common understanding of freedom of expression proportionality. 
On the other hand, Yevhen Fetchenko, who is the director of the Kyiv Mohila School of Journalism, said that if hashtag Ukraine implement this, this would be the greatest contribution to protection of information sovereignty of Ukraine, ever right and timely, says Mr. Fetchenko. Uh, knowing Yevhen as a uh, very uh, fierce adherent of the freedom of speech, I think that he had to think over this uh, quite seriously before he published such a tweet. Earlier we spoke to experts to gather their opinion uh, how efficient is this ban, because uh, from earlier uh, interviews of Mr. Bedenko, I remember his phrase that this is a fight against the danger which rose in the 21st century by using the 20th century means. So about how efficient this ban is, and uh, we spoke to Freedom House Ukraine's project director Matthew Schaaf, to uh, Vitaly Moroz, head of new media at Inter News Ukraine, Svetlana Matvienko, media and uh, information war researcher, and Russian independent journalist Irina Borogan, author of the investigation The Red Web, the struggle between Russia's digital dictators and the new online revolutionaries. We'll come back to discussion with our studio guests after we watch those sound bites. President's decree to ban Russian social networks uh, and email services is a continuation of the government policy uh, to block uh, activities of Russian companies uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so first of all, it is uh, a step against Russian businesses to make profit of Ukrainian citizens. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's a restriction of access of Ukrainian citizens uh, to Russian social networks. All Russian uh, propaganda messages or fakes are disseminated through social media uh, and we know that Russia employs uh, factories of trolls, so they uh, spread this information more intensively, uh, so they target Ukrainian users as well. Uh, Ukrainian government should better have explained this uh, decree, uh, but it is partly justified. Uh, because Russian aggression continues like for three years uh, and Ukrainian government considers these steps like back in 2014. Uh, Freedom House uh, and other organizations are concerned about um, the tendency of Ukrainian government to uh, block information, block access to, uh, to resources, to websites uh, and so on. Um, because uh, we think that it will uh, make it more difficult for people to access information, news, uh, to express themselves. Um, and uh, as far as we've seen so far, this decision wasn't made um, in, uh, in a way that's consistent with um, the expectations in a, a democratic society. So I see this decision more tactical than strategic. Uh, although I'm sure that Ukrainian government considered it a st strategic decision, a certain contribution in the future, and etc. However, I think it's more tactical because it affects just the current situation. And this tactics is more symbolic than practical. It means that they can, you know, share themselves on social media, the fact that they're actually doing something. But in fact, uh, there are so many means to avoid this control and this blocking uh, and all those means are pretty familiar to uh, to people especially uh, on the territories like russia belarus ukraine and etc so that's why i think there will be so many ways to avoid the blocking but in 2012 after the arab spring and then especially after the moscow protest in 2011 2012 uh, the Kremlin implemented uh, the internet filtering and uh, so-called blacklist on the internet in Russia. And since then, uh, we have internet censorship in the country. Um, uh, the mechanism of this internet censorship is very simple. A special uh, censorship agency called Roskomnadzor uh, consists of uh, implemented a special blacklists of, web, of uh, banned websites that include uh, a lot of, um, more than a million websites uh, started with, I don't know, uh, 
information about suicide and child pornography and ended with information about uh, about extremism that according to the Russian law means all independent all information independent from the Kremlin. I completely disagree uh, that social networks could be a tool of propaganda or of somebody or something because uh, the social network is horizontal structures and information on social network is sharing and posted uncontrollable because there is no hierarchical structure uh, as Kremlin also thinks and the Kremlin tried to suppress uh, social social networks from the top many times when the war in Ukraine started and the Russian authorities strong, strongly denied the military presence of Russian army on the ground. Uh, the social network of Kontakte became the first proof that Kremlin lied because uh, a lot of Russian soldiers started posting their a lot of information about their units, their photographs, and this was the real, the first proof that Russian army are on the ground, and the social network helps. So we're back to the studio of the Sunday show, and I would like to ask uh, Mr. Tulio of the Ukrainian Internet Association to be the first to comment on what you just saw and heard. Yes, I would like to comment about uh, how uh, this uh, ban uh, is legal. Uh, the first of all, uh, uh, Defense uh, Council uh, that uh, issued this, uh, this ban uh, by the article of uh, Article 10 of uh, the law about this Council. Uh, this uh, decision is mandatory only for uh, state structures, not for uh, private person or commercial person, as uh, most of uh, internet operators and providers are. The second uh, is uh, by the a lot of other laws, uh, any ban can be uh, done only uh, based on court decision, uh, which is not done uh, now. Uh, so uh, the problem is uh, this uh, illegal uh, decision, uh, in fact, is implemented because of uh, most of all uh, main operators, main uh, telecom operators already banned uh, these resources. So for me, it means only one. Uh, we should take screwdriver, go to the Bankova Street, famous building, screw out uh, this table, uh, this plate with President of Ukraine, and screw up new table, Tsar, because of illegal uh, decision, in fact, is implemented. Thank you very much. Artem Bidenko, State Secretary of the Information Ministry. That's a manipulation of facts because censorship is blocking and banning of content. And the decision of National Security and Defense Council doesn't block content. You can read opposition, critics, anywhere. You can watch on TV the resources which uh, are threat for national security are banned. These resources are owned by the country which kills Ukrainian citizens. And that's a problem in this discussion. Because the manipulation is going to the questions of censorship and we are trying to uh, show the thin border and that the challenge today is also not to go further but to stop and understand what is the difference between just sites, just resources, and words, articles, uh, discussion. That is challenge today, not uh, quarreling about if we need this ban or we not. We do need stopping Russian information attack uh, on Ukraine. How can we do it? So How can we do it if we don't uh, stop uh, this, the most popular uh, resources in Ukraine? A and final remark from an Mr. Another Tulio. argument, yeah. this is economical sanctions. Today, the, you uh, said on the beginning of our program that all these sites, all these resources are on the top 10 of Ukrainian uh, uh, top sites. Why don't we help maybe some protectionism, Ukrainian companies be on the top, get this money for internet advertising and so on and so forth. Why we give this money to Russians? Can you tell me? So the question was and is why uh, do, uh, wh why you didn't it do uh, it legal way? By the court decision. 
It is by legal the law. way, the decision it's not of... not legal way. Uh, way when you legal, say you, I presume you mean uh, the state structures, not Mr. Like Medenko, officials. his information uh, ministry, because they do not have a part in this. Am I right? Not yes. you, but government, of course. So yeah. there is legal way. It's possible to do it legal way, but uh, it was done uh, by crying illegal way. It Why? is legal way after the decision of Council, National Security Council, the other officials, government bodies, will uh, suggest law drafts, other documents, which help implement this decision. But it's this is right now. normal. <laughs> okay, okay. But there are no uh, threats for providers or citizens to overcome this ban, for example. Right now, uh, the illegal uh, decree of uh, this uh, Committee for Defense, uh, in fact, is implemented. Your words will be true after you show me the first fine for not doing this. Kind of okay, uh, my last question, and I would like to require a very brief answers from both of you, is wouldn't you think that the appeal to Ukrainians to stop using social networks, um, bad social networks like Odnoklasniki and uh, Vkontakte, would have more actual effect than this? Uh, try this attempt to ban it in legal form. Mr. Biden. Unfortunately, no. no. Three years ago, there was such an appeal, a lot of appeals from different public uh, leaders, and still we see these social networks are very popular. Moreover, mm -hmm. we had two decrees uh, which uh, banned officials from using mail rule. Mm -hmm. And still, still we had it. a lot of officials, especially in regions, who had their emails, mail rule emails, and okay. Yandex rule emails. Okay. So this was the only way to uh, solve this situation. I get your point, Mr. Tulio. How this official was punish punished for using mail rule uh, mail account? You can't punish people for using in their private life. That means democracy. Uh, they use it in work. I yeah, got yeah. I, I got uh, my company got request from uh, Kiberpolis of uh, Dnipropetrovsk, for example, uh, was written from Mailro account. They used yeah, and that's what Mr. Bidenko said. Yeah. Because nobody punished. That's my question okay. was, and I got the answer from the state official. Now the answer from the public uh, activist. I believe yes, it's possible because uh, that's not only uh, some kind of uh, statement from. Uh, Ukrainian government person. It should be a big uh, advertising company. Uh, it should be good alternatives. Uh, so it's it's a big process. It costs money, of course. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tuliev, Maxim Tuliev, Ukraine International uh, Internet, Internet Association, and Artem Bidenko, the State Secretary of the Information Ministry of Ukraine. And following this discussion, we would like to give a broader context. How does big data and social networks influence political process? My colleague Natalia Humanyuk had the chance to talk to Joshua Tucker, co-author of the award-winning politics and policy blog, The Monkey Cage, at the Washington Post, which connects political scientists and political conversation. Joshua is also professor of politics an affiliated professor of Russian and Slavic studies and an affiliated professor of data science at the New York University. So let's watch it. To what extent the big data, the data today, influence the politics? This new media technology of being able to tweet or put things on Facebook or on the contact day, where that bleeds over into the established media and its coverage. And I think this is where President Trump is a kind of mastermind of this new world, where he's able to direct the conversation on TV, in, on our, t our, our news networks like CNN and Fox News, by tweeting. The incredible power of Facebook is that if you know from your own campaign research that white 40 to 50 year old voters in Wisconsin and Michigan and Ohio are particularly concerned about trade deals, you can go to Facebook and say, I want to run ads that reach white 40 to 50 year old voters in Michigan, Wisconsin and Ohio. And I want them to talk, this is the ad, this is the very specific ad I want to run that will appear on the Facebook feeds. And when you combine that with the sort of huge big data sources that are out there that allow 
campaigns and marketers to learn about preferences of citizens. This allows for, this is, I think, it allows for this kind of sneaky feeling that you're being targeted with exactly what's important to you. What social media allows you to do, or anything that does these kind of micro-targeting of advertisements, is that whereas previously you had to, if you ran a television ad that everyone's got to see, you've got to balance between these two things. If I'm going to target ads on social media that I know are only going to my base, I can make them much more designed to the base. So to the extent that you would, are, you would think, and this may or may not be the case, that what the base wants to see is stuff that is more polarizing, that is more negative about the, about the party. It allows you to deliver those messages to your base without subsequently, or hopefully from the politician's point of view, without contaminating those wavering voters that you're trying to win over with a message that they might not like. There was this recent uh, great article in The Guardian, you know, about the companies like the Cambridge Analytics, you know, where really this data is used by the political campaigners with a very clear message, and there are all, way, all things they can use, you know, hacking, you know, paid commercials, defamation campaign, trolls, bots. So there are a lot of other opportunities. So can we really speak about the dark side of that and what we really know? This idea of trying to break into other campaigns, uh, email accounts, it's illegal and it's new because this is sort of different, right? You're breaking into electronic communications. It's Dip, and we need to think about it. So, but we also have to be aware of the sort of history of this kind of political competition. So, conceptually, the idea that you're trying to smear your opponent and you're not just having a civil discussion about the issues. What are also the new tools? If you speak about the trolls, board defamation campaign, uh, and really, do we know about the particular, you know, companies which are really uh, doing that? You know, political PR was always there. So right. Had it changed the nature? There is discussion among experts on this about a kind of ecosystem and economy. You know, I think the, the, the key thing to understand here is that when we think about communications related to politics online, right, there are different ways that actors who are, uh, who are upset about the conversations that are going on online or who want to seek to influence it can try to change that conversation, right? We've heard lots about the Great Firewall of China where you have posts that are removed and censored. But another technique is to try to alter the climate online by altering the conversation. And that's where we get into kind of bots and trolls where if you're an actor, you can not just say, oh, we're gonna restrict people's access to internet content. You can say, no, we're going to hope people are coming to the internet, but when they come to the internet, we're gonna make sure they see our messages. And I think what you're seeing right now is we're in a particular moment where there is a strong power where small voices can be amplified greatly online by the kind of media ecosystem in which they're embedded, where you can have small numbers of people sharing information that's harmful to one particular candidate or another in a political context or person. or person. And that information can then be magnified by bots, magnified by trolls, but then you see the media then covers that story that that's going on, and then the mainstream media picks up the first media that's covering it, and these things get blown out into the open. With these technological developments happening sort of so rapid fire, right? If you think about the distance from the printing press yeah. to radio to television, and now the changes that are going on on almost a yearly and sometimes monthly basis in what kind of internet connections are available, what kind of, you know, live streaming television wouldn't have been imagined, you know, how many years ago, and now we have video and we have YouTube and we have all these things going on, is that it creates a real cat and mouse dynamic where one player makes a move, the other player catches up. So this idea that social media was liberation technology, that it would help pro-democracy activists around the world uh, deal with less democratic regimes, for a period of time, that was probably right because the authoritarian regimes that these activists were using social media to organize against were not aware of this as a threat. But once they become aware of it as a threat, they take steps. I think my personal take, you know, is that the, the fake news that we saw in the U.S. election in 2016 took a lot of people by surprise, right? It won't take a lot of people by surprise the next time it comes. It already didn't, I think you saw, it took less people by, fewer people by surprise in the French elections when this happened, right? So 
you sometimes get with social media and with these changing interactions between technolo technology and politics, these particular moments where one side or the other has an advantage. But now you've got all the platforms working on ways to eliminate fake news, putting up barriers that are out there. And we're back to the studio of Hromadsky International. This week, Ukrainians commemorate the 73rd anniversary of the deportation of Crimean Tatars by Stalin. On the night of the 18th of May 1944, the entire nation, up to 200,000 people, were forced to leave their native peninsula and they weren't allowed back en masse until the collapse of the Soviet Union. Many people have died in the exile. Now almost 300,000 Crimean Tatars live in the Crimean Peninsula occupied by Russia as the idea of staying on their native land became an important part of their national identity. The Soviet deportation has inflicted considerable damage on the Crimean Tatar language and this language is considered to be unique on the post-Soviet territory. How has it changed? during the years of deportation and how has it changed during the 25 years while Ukraine was independent and what has happened to it over three years since Russia annexed Crimea and uh, when dozens of thousands of Crimean Tatars chose to leave the peninsula for what they call continental Ukraine. Here's our report. The Crimean Tatar language teacher, Afisei Amiramzaeva, is reviewing spelling rules with the children. They often get confused between Roman and Cyrillic alphabets. Both of them are used in the Crimean Tatar language. Moreover, all of them speak different dialects. Some families are from the south, others from the north. Afisei admits that it's not easy. There is also a lack of teaching materials. You can't get hold of literature in the Crimean Tatar language in Ukrainian bookshops. If you want to buy magazines, books or manuals, you have to rely on word of mouth. However, Afisei does not complain. We have a saying, if you keep digging, eventually you'll end up with a lake. The fact alone that we have the opportunity to study our native language is a big advantage. Teachers keep on working. They pour their souls into teaching, preparing plays in Crimean Tatar. Parents can't spend all their time with their child teaching them perfect language skills. Before the annexation of Crimea, children from no more than 10 families attended this cultural and educational center. Now more than 50 children attend and the number is constantly growing. New families arrive in Kyiv after each new wave of arrests. Is it possible to preserve language here? It's very difficult, especially for children. This is a new environment for the children. They have changed schools, they've lost contacts with their relatives. Our center is the only place where storytellings, plays, and other events are held in Crimean Tatar. Crimean Tatar language, music, and dance classes take place in a school in Kiev. The administration opened their doors to the Crimean Tatars without question, allowing as many classes as the center required. Anifei Kurtsetova is very grateful for that. In her words, the government talks a lot about Crimean Tatars, but they get more attention and assistance from ordinary citizens and activists. The Crimean Tatar language appeared on Ukraine's linguistic map in the early 90s, when Crimean Tatars began repatriation to Crimea. Nearly 70% of them were living in Uzbekistan. After the mass deportation, on May 18, 1944, the language stopped being used in society and was only spoken in homes. For these people, far away from home, all they could do was stick together and stay in contact. Half a century in exile has severely damaged the language. It was even erased from the map of Crimea. Under the 1945 decree, hundreds of original Crimean Tatar place names, which each told the story of a city or village, were replaced by common Soviet ones. Therefore, many Crimean Tatar children actually had to learn their national language from scratch. The Ukrainian filmmaker and actor with Crimean Tatar roots also had to refine his language skills. 
the language skills of his family, as well as thousands of other families, deteriorated as a result of the mass deportation. I lived in a special city called Yangiyul. There were Koreans, Volga Germans, Chechens living there, but Crimean Tatar people made up the majority. All these ethnic groups communicated in Russian. When Atem enrolled in drama school, he realized that a basic understanding of the language was not enough. He wanted to speak the language fluently. His film Chai Tarma, which is about the events of 1944, was produced partially in the Crimean Tatar language. In his words, if he decided to produce the film only in his native language, he wouldn't have been able to find enough actors. <laughs> Kalise Zinadine is a TV anchor and young teacher from Crimea who is still a student herself. She also likes to give interesting facts about Crimean Tatar language to her students. Kalise moved to Kyiv in 2014. Her friends asked her to tutor their children. Then adults also started turning to Kalise. She improvised and thought of the lessons herself, including the games. I wish there were cinema clubs where films or series in Crimean Tatar could be shown. It would be cool to translate a popular TV series like Friends into Crimean Tatar. It's quite lighthearted. If only there were these kinds of resources. But everything takes time. I have a lot of ideas for producing manuals and videos in Crimean Tatar. Movies and animated films are Kalise's favorite resources. The Crimean Tatar ATR TV used to dub many popular movies and animated films. Even the Swedish cartoon character Carlson on the Roof would speak in Crimean Tatar. However, Kalisi has already shown her students all the dubbed and animated films that exist several times. They need new ones. Kalise also dreams of seeing classics from all around the world translated into Crimean Tatar on the bookshelves. She believes that this will happen one day. One of her dreams has already come true. She started dreaming in Crimean Tatar and was so happy that she did not wake up. Welcome back to the Sunday show. Ukraine's President Petro Poroshenko met with German Chancellor Angela Merkel in Berlin prior to the G7 meeting, which has to happen on the 26th of May. What we know, they were discussing how to implement the Minsk agreement. Also, according to Mr. Poroshenko's press service, they have agreed to coordinate further talks with the newly elected French President Emmanuel Macron. Today, Germany seems to play a key role in the solution of Russian-Ukrainian conflict. Is it the only force which may contain the Kremlin? Our colleague Volodymyr Yermolenko talked to the famous German historian and number one researcher of Russian affairs, Karl Schlögel. We have also talked about how the German society sees the conflict after the three years of war. How would you describe the changes which appeared in Germany public opinion and politics with regards to Ukraine and Russia over the, the, the past several years? I mean, the main event uh, changing and transforming the perception and the view of most Germans uh, towards Ukraine was the event around uh, Euromaidan and, and the Crimea uh, occupation. And uh, with the uh, struggles and conflicts uh, every day coming in the news in the afternoon and in the evening, uh, people realized that uh, there is something going on what was beyond the borders of their perception. And this changed the mental uh, map or the mental cartography uh, in most of the German audience, and I would say in, in Western Europe. And they got an idea that there is a big country, I mean the biggest country per, per territory, you have 40 million people, uh, you, you have a country bigger than uh, France, and uh, with a great history, uh, with uh, uh, very impressive uh, culture, uh, cities, and people knew that there is Odessa, there is uh, Kiev, but in their uh, 
pre-Maidan perception. Ukraine always was a part of the Soviet Union and they perceived Ukraine as a kind of uh, province or backyard of the big metropolis, uh, Moscow, etc. And this has changed. And Ukraine is put on the map of most people, but it's not for sure and it's not uh, for taken for granted, you know. There are so many crises in Europe or coming over uh, to Europe, the migration crisis, the Euro crisis, the Greek crisis, the Brexit, etc. So that some people are um, inclined to say what should we bother uh, and to have to do with the problems of Ukraine. But you, you are a person that wrote books about Ukraine. What would you advise to European or American journalists or historians uh, or experts when they, when they touch upon the Ukrainian topic? What, what to understand, what to start from? The best and the m most important advice I can give is to go, to go, to see, to get uh, an impression and not, uh, and of course to study, I mean to read books and we have wonderful books about Ukraine by, by Paul Magosi and uh, Oras Subtelny and uh, Mark von Hagen and, and other, and Andreas Kappeler, my German colleague. Uh, wonderful books, but the, I would say the most convincing thing is to go. And uh, most people cannot believe uh, Ukraine today and, and Kiev. Uh, yesterday there was on, on the Maidan this uh, festival of colored fountains and uh, relaxed people moving back and forth on Kreschatik. It was like Kurfürstendamm, yeah? Uh, but uh, people cannot imagine that this takes place in a country which is at war, and it is at war, yeah? Every day are uh, people, soldiers killed, uh, wounded, uh, etc. And no, I say you should go and you should not only trust uh, to, to the books you can read to newspapers, you should have a look on your own. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, we had Karl Schlögel, the prominent German historian, who recently published a book about Ukraine. Stay on Romatsky. This is Romatsky International and more international topics, although about the inner policy. The U.S. domestic policy is being looked at closely from abroad as probably never before. Firing the FBI director isn't any longer the case of uh, specifically U.S., especially if this decision is driven by the investigation of Donald Trump's connections to Russia. Here in Kiev, we had a chance to talk to a former U.S. congressman, David Dreyer, a Republican Party politician who served as a member of the United States House of Representatives from California from 1981 to 2013. Here's what he said to Romatsky. Firing by Donald Trump of the FBI Director James Comey, do you personally think this was a mistake? The reason that I said earlier that I'm encouraged is that this appointment that has just taken place since I've been here in Kyiv of the former director of the FBI, Robert Mueller, uh, to investigate what the ties are between Russia and Vladimir Putin and the potential ties with the Trump campaign, which Donald Trump says are non-existent, um, is something that again demonstrates that the institutions are working because it's Donald Trump's assistant deputy attorney general, Mr. Rosenstein, who has bipartisan support. He's highly regarded by, again, both Democrats and Republicans across the board. I've never heard criticism of the deputy attorney general. He's the one who's made the appointment of this investigator who's going to be looking into all of this. And today I heard Donald Trump say that he supports the appointment of this investigator former FBI director, he said that it's a witch hunt, and he used other words to describe it, saying that none of it is true, but he does support the notion of this investigation. So that gives me some hope and, and encouragement uh, for the future here. With all the hope and encouragement which you have, 
uh, are you also concerned? The recognition that Vladimir Putin is a barbarian who has tortured, who has been responsible for heinous acts, heinous acts under his leadership. I mean, he is an authoritarian dictator. Uh, and to argue that Russia is a vibrant democracy is just plain wrong. I'm here in Ukraine in large part because this is a country that is at war. You as Ukrainians deal daily with the fact that there are Ukrainians being killed every day. We were just talking about this in the car on the way over here. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that there are no ties, but I think that this investigation which is charged specifically with looking into whether or not there are ties will be very enlightening and I think it'll be fair. And I think that this investigation should be something to which the Ukrainian people look for some direction and some uh, encouragement. I think, that that's, I think that that's a positive sign. So it should make the Ukrainian people feel less horrified during the past several days, uh, we've been hearing more and more the word impeachment. Mm -hmm. My mother and father told me to never say and never do. And so I personally have a difficult time with his style. I have a difficult time with many of the things that have been said. Um, I'm giving him um, support as an American citizen. I'm concerned. Uh, and I've heard the term impeachment. And um, again, like the people of Ukraine, I mean, every day it is fascinating to see. I will say this to be brutally honest, I feel very grateful that I'm no longer in the United States Congress because um, as I look at what's going on in Washington, I'm happy to be back in California. Republican Party take responsibility for what Donald Trump uh, does. If it's good, I suppose the Republican Party will. If it's bad, there will be Republicans who, you know, understandably will not. I mean, again, um, I want Donald Trump to be successful. Uh, I virulently disagree with him on more than a few issues. The trade issue has been a very tough one for me. I'm so proud. I worked on the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, the Transatlantic, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and virtually every trade agreement into which the United States has embarked over the past um, you know, two decades. And uh, so I disagree with him on that issue. Um, but I'm encouraged in that he seems on the issue of trade, for example, to rather than saying he's going to tear up trade agreements, he wants to improve them. And that to me is a positive sign. Ukraine should be a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And I worked on what was called the Membership Action Plan going back several years to make that happen, and I believe that Ukraine should be able to accede to the European Union as well. And by virtue of that, working on the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, I would love to see Ukraine as part of what would be a free trade agreement between the United States of America and the European Union. How do you see the future of U.S.-Ukraine relations? We want to work on dealing with a wide range of these questions that are out there. And similarly, there is recognition uh, by people within this administration of the, the great things that the Ukrainian people have done and the challenges that they're facing today. So I'm optimistic uh, about the prospect of seeing the relationship between Ukraine and the United States grow to be an even stronger one. Well, this is basically it for you from the Sunday show, but I do have one important announcement for you. Go to en.romatske.ua when you want to know more about geopolitical turmoil happening in Eastern Europe. Follow Romatske International on social networks and write to us. Stay in touch. As for now, from me, Andrei Kulikov, and the entire team of the Sunday show, goodbye. Thank you.